Thank you very much, and I'm pleased to be here this afternoon to talk about, as was mentioned, uh, the impact of climate change and wild weather on mental and physical health, lost time from work, and the need to prepare. Or, in other words, otherwise stated, uh, when things go wrong along the lines of that which you see depicted in these pictures, uh, too much water in the wrong place in the upper left-hand corner causing flooding at the community level, and then down to and including water in uh, some poor person's basement. Or we have problems with uh, uh, fire affecting homes, businesses, and uh, communities in forested regions. Or increasingly so, we're dealing with extreme heat. When these types of events occur, uh, uh, how well prepared are we as a country to, to uh, put adaptation measures in place to mitigate the risk associated with these uh, types of events? And from a physical infrastructure cost perspective, we have a pretty good idea of, of what the costs of these types of effects uh, entail. But what we have less knowledge about is what are the mental or the psychosocial impacts realized when the, these types of events occur? How much lost time from work, if anything, do people realize when they go through these types of events? And indeed, if we can determine that there are mental and physical health costs associated with these events or lost time from work, that gives us more, if you will, ammunition to move forward with uh, the promotion of adaptation programs to make it such that when they're deployed, we don't end up in these situations in the first place. So that's more or less where we're heading is building the argument as to why we need to, as a country, better prepare for these types of events. It's mitigating the, the financial costs associated with these events, but also the mental, the social, the psychosocial costs, the lost time from work. So that's where we're heading. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, kind of the uh, next slide. So just to, to drill down on this a little bit by way of direction and where we're heading uh, by way of agenda, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is profile that climate change is real and it's irreversible. It's, it's effectively here to stay. And my guess is for most of the people attending this talk, they're, they're already on board relative to this reality. But I really want to drive home the point of the, the, the irreversibility of climate change. We might slow down the rate of climate change, but we're not going to go backwards on it. And that should prompt us to act with urgency to better prepare for extreme weather risks. So I really want to make that point. Then I'll turn to documenting the costs of climate change uh, in the country. Uh, first, the financial costs, and then I'm going to turn to the mental or the psychosocial costs associated with uh, uh, extreme weather events, and in particular, flooding. Uh, these, are, as I mentioned earlier, these are, in my opinion, they're, they're not all that well documented. So hence our focus on, on that component. And then points one and two, quite frankly, they're, they're effectively bad news. The, this isn't information that's going to put you in a good, good mood, to be, to be blunt. The, but things get better under point number three when we turn to how to mitigate the risk associated with climate change and extreme weather. And in Canada, over the period of the last, I would say, five to seven years or so, we've developed pretty good adaptation standards and guidelines that, when deployed, can work to make it such that we don't suffer the ravages of flooding or fires or extreme heat, et cetera. And we need to deploy those measures more aggressively. So at the end, uh, the discussion will focus in that domain. And everything that I present is fundamentally premised on the fact that the best way to solve a problem is to not have it in the first place. And that is through the deployment of adaptation or preparedness for extreme weather events. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start with the first point first, that climate change is real, it's irreversible, and the severity of extreme weather will increase and uh, get more challenging going forward. And this isn't just my uh, cavalier opinion. This is the opinion expressed just two or three weeks ago in a recent report from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the, the, port, the report they released, uh, Climate Change 2021, the Physical uh, Science Basis, where in that report, and I'll just read from the screen and it's in italics because I'm quoting directly, they say, it is indisputable that human activities, which refers to the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall, and droughts, more frequent and severe. 
and then consistent with this um, uh, 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 position of the Intergovernmental Panel, uh, about two years ago or a year and a half ago, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada released the report, Canada's Changing Climate Report 2019, which was authored by a dozen or so uh, climate scientists from Environment Canada. In that report, they said, Canada's climate has warmed and will warm further in the future, driven by human influence, again, the burning of fossil fuels, and this warming is effectively uh, irreversible. So climate change is here to stay. And, uh, and by the way, that doesn't mean I'm not a fan of working aggressively to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions or lower greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm a fan of uh, uh, accords like the Paris Accord and the talks that will be coming up in, uh, in the UK for COP26 in, in a couple of months. But we need to recognize that as much as the efforts are going into mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, we're, uh, 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 climate change is locked into the system. And what is the nature of why and or how it is locked into the system? So uh, next slide, please. So why is climate change irreversible? And first, we'll just focus on the left side of the slide. Uh, what you're looking at on the left, and particularly the lower left-hand corner, um, is uh, data from the International Energy Agency, and uh, which is the preeminent agency in the world that looks at energy use. And what you can see is that as of uh, two th now, 2020 or 2021, close enough, um, approximately 80% of world energy supply as of this moment comes from about a third, a third, a third coal, oil, and natural gas. Uh, three fossil fuel-based sources that when burnt uh, release uh, CO2 emissions into the air, greenhouse gas emissions into the air, which further drive uh, uh, climate change, warming on the planet, expressions of extreme weather risk. The, the International Energy Agency has also forward projected to 2035 and said, well, what will energy use look like in the world at that point in time, given efforts to, to, to get off of fossil fuels? And we can still see that we, we drop from about 80% of world energy supply coming from coal, oil, natural gas down to about 76%. But it is still 76% of world energy supply will come from a, about a third, a third, a third, a third, a third coal, oil, and natural gas. But what's notable here is the actual carbon footprint of release of CO2 emissions into the air in, you know, in about 2035 will be about 12 to 15% greater in total amount than is occurring today. And the question is why? And the fundamental driver that's driving that increase more than anything else is increasing population on the planet. Right now, as per the upper part of the slide, the, the world's uh, population increases net per hour by about 9,000 people per hour. If you subtract deaths from births, Every single hour, there's about 9,000 more people on the planet, which translates through to about another 80 to 82 million uh, people per year, which means by 2030, 35, we are going to have another 1.2 billion people on the planet for sure, on top of the more or less 7.8 billion people we currently have. And therein lies the major challenge, population growth. And just to put these numbers in perspective, by the way, and, and I'm not out to depress you, but the, you know, reality is reality. The, if you go back to, for example, the time of Christ, so we'll call that zero. Uh, at that point in time, more or less 2,000 years ago, there were 250 million people on the planet total. It basically, it was empty. And it took from uh, the time of Christ to 1930, more or less 2,000 years, to get to 2 billion people on the planet. In 1930, there were 2 billion people on the planet. From 1930 till now, more or less 90 years, we've added 5.8 billion people to the planet. We've added more than two and a half times as many people to the planet over the last 90 years as compared to what previously took uh, 2,000 years and the numbers continue to grow. So there's one driver. Secondly, on the right-hand side of the slide, climate change is effectively driving climate change through three primary mechanisms. There are more, but three in particular I'll mention. Uh, number one, as depicted in the picture, we see an overall loss of ice in the Arctic region of Arctic region of about 40 to 45 percent over the last more or less 45 years. And why is this occurring? Well, 
through the burning of fossil fuels, we started to warm up the planet. And as we warm things up, we went from, uh, in the Arctic region, the bright surface of snow and ice, which when sunlight hits snow and ice, which is white, it reflects about 80% of uh, the sunlight's energy back into space. But once you start to heat things up and the snow and ice melts to the dark surface of water, when sunlight hits the dark surface of water, uh, only about 20% of that energy uh, reflects back into space and the rest of the energy stays in the system. And the more energy that stays in the system, the more heating we get, and the more heating we get, the more snow and ice that melts. So it's this, the uh, system drives itself. Also, in the, uh, we have the melting of permafrost, uh, which began with the burning of fossil fuels warming up, causing permanently frozen ground to melt. And when that ground melts, it releases uh, methane gas. Methane is a potent greenhouse uh, gas that when increasing concentrations in the atmosphere causes warming. So as uh, permafrost melts, we get more, perma more methane gas in the air, which causes more warming. The more warming we get, the more permafrost that melts. And then through a slightly more complicated system that I won't go into the details, we've lost about 16 to 18% of algae in the surface layer of the oceans over the last 40, 45 years, which creates another positive feedback system. So my point in all of this is to really drive home the point that as, as much as we have laudable efforts in place to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, climate change and extreme weather risk is not going away. The challenges that we're realizing today due to heat, fire, floods, et cetera, are going to get increasingly challenging going forward. Therefore, we need to embrace adaptation rapidly. So uh, next slide, please. Now, what do the costs, first we'll do the financial costs, then we'll go to uh, mental health, psychosocial impacts. But what do the costs associated with all these types of events look like? So you're looking at what you're looking at here is data for Canada. And this is the catastrophic loss insurable claims realized in Canada over the period on the x-axis from 1983 up to 2020. And what you'll, uh, um, and, and by the way, in insurance terms, uh, a catastrophic event is any event like a flood, fire, hailstorm, windstorm. Uh, if it triggers more than $25 million in claims, that's called a catastrophic event. And those numbers get added up on an annual basis and presented as you, you see here. So this is the amount of money paid out by the insurers in, in given years for catastrophic events. And, and by the way, all this data is corrected for inflation and for per capita wealth accumulation. In other words, uh, if you were insuring uh, uh, twice as many homes today as you did 10 years ago, we would assume with nothing else going on that the insurance claims would be twice as high. So that uh, uh, element has been factored out of this data such that horizontally, we're looking at a comparison of apples to apples. And what's notable here is that from 1983 up to 2008, the insurance industry in Canada could count on paying out between about 250 to 450 million dollars per year. But everything started to change as about uh, from 2009 onwards, whereby for 11 out of the last 12 years, the catastrophic loss claims have gone over a billion dollars per year for um, every year for each of, uh, for 11 out of the last uh, 12 years. And uh, for an average cost of 1.8 to 1.9 uh, billion dollars. And the culprit that's driving more than half of the upward bend in this curve, about 55%, is too much water in the wrong place. Flooding, and in particular, residential basement flooding. Residential basement flooding is the number one cost of climate change being realized in uh, Canada today. And, um, and that's being driven by uh, precipitation events that bring down larger volumes of water over shorter periods of time or you know, bigger storms complement it with uh, the fact that, for example, throughout southern Canada, we've lost a lot of the natural infrastructure that was originally here. The forest, the fields and wetlands that went in place and storms hit, it gives water a place to go and reside and store on, uh, store on the landscape and, and, and slowly discharge into the groundwater system or downstream. Um, over the last 100 years in Canada, we've lost about, through the southern regions of the provinces, about 60 to 80% of the natural infrastructure that was originally here, it's now gone. It's either paved over 
or turned into agricultural development, um, uh, which when water hits pavement, it doesn't hang around too long. It runs off quickly to the lowest place around, which contributes to flooding. We also have aging municipal infrastructure and aging housing infrastructure. And it's a combination of those four primary factors, more precipitation, loss of natural infrastructure, aging municipal and aging housing infrastructure, all contributing to the upward bend in this curve. The, uh, but it's at the point now for Canada that literally from Halifax to Victoria, we have growth in the uninsurability of the housing market for Canada, where uh, people uh, increasingly, so, and I don't mean exclusively, but in pockets showing up across the country, where people are finding out that based on claims they've made or the area they live in that's deemed to be at high risk of flooding, when their insurance comes up for renewal, they'll find out, they may find out that they can't get insurance coverage for, for flood damage for their home. They can still get it for fire and theft, but not for flooding. Um, or the, uh, and by the way, the, the uh, uh, premiums that people pay for home insurance over the last five to six years have increased as per the upper left-hand corner of the slide by 20 to 25% over the last five years. 60% of that increase is due to flood risk. Um, increasingly so, we have people that, uh, who are insurable but the cap limits on insurance for if you have a flooded basement are coming down that the amount the insurers may wish to cover would be in the zone of perhaps 10 to $20,000 or willing to cover 10 to $20,000. Well, the average cost of a flooded basement in Canada right now and uh, for, uh, and it's fairly uniform for, for um, cities across the country is $43,000. The average cost of a flooded basement in the country is $43,000. So if you owned a home and you had a flooded basement that hit the average cost of $43,000 and you had a $10,000 insurance cap that you received, that could just in the blink of the eye leave you on the hook for $30,000 or $40,000 or $50,000 that you have to pay out of pocket to remedy the situation of bringing your house back into working order. And by the way, um, if, if you're fixing the house under those circumstances is non-negotiable. In other words, if you get a flood on a Monday morning, you have to be solving it by Wednesday of that week or the house is uninhabitable because this is really nasty stuff. This is, this is sewer water in your basement. So uh, what we want to implement is figure out ways to, to mitigate that risk, which I'll go to in a few minutes. But what we've also done now though, we've examined what are, those are the, the financial out-of-pocket costs realized or that are, are going up over time. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, for every dollar in insured loss that you see on this chart, there's an additional three to four dollars in costs associated with, with that which is not insurable. So, uh, so this is certainly problematic. Um, but also you can recognize that if people in communities, homes and communities that are flooding out, it, it would be, seem to be intuitively obvious that by the way, there's a lot of mental or psychosocial stress associated with this type of phenomena we're talking about. So if we could have the next slide, please. What we uh, see anecdotally is, and, and, and we could fill up pages and pages and pages of slides with these, these types of headlines, that people who suffer in communities that realize flooding or fires and so forth, the mental stress that they suffer or the psychosocial stress they suffer is, is uh, substantial. So we see lots of evidence of anecdotally along the, those lines as per the, the headlines you see here. And uh, boy, oh boy, in just the last year, you could really You'd have to go to microfiche to, to store all these titles. But one title that I wanna draw in on here because I'm gonna follow up with the community in a minute is more or less in the center of the slide where you see it says, worst flooding in 20 years, Burlington cleaning up after a uh, record rainstorm. Well, Burlington uh, is a community about uh, 45 minutes west of Toronto, uh, located on Lake Ontario. And in August, 2014, they had a major uh, flood event whereby about 192 millimeters of rain came down over a six hour period, causing substantial flooding, excuse me, throughout uh, Burlington. It ended up flooding about 3,300 homes, which for a, a community the size of Burlington is a lot of homes, including the mayor's home who had lived there for 30 years and never seen a drop of water in his basement. He now had five and a half feet of water in his basement following this flood. Well, we went to Burlington three years after this flood, 
to conduct a study to see from the perspective of psychosocial or mental health stress amongst other factors, how much stress of anything do people feel in these communities three years after the flood? And, and this involved a, a, a person or persons going through, through the community in Burlington on streets that were flooded versus a street that wasn't flooded or to homes on a street that were flooded and other homes on a street that weren't flooded. So we had a sort of a control group, the non-flooded versus the impacted group, the flooded homes. And we wanted to see from the perspective of documenting stress, was there any difference in the stress people felt three years later if big storms hit versus um, um, or, 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 or not in the aftermath of this type of event. And quite frankly, when we first formulated this study and the idea of somebody going through a community on a Saturday afternoon with a, with a, a sheet of paper and wanting to spend 10 minutes at the door of people's houses asking a whole bunch of questions about psychosocial or mental stress that they might have realized from flooding, I didn't think we'd get anywhere because I didn't think anybody would even take the time to answer these, or to participate in this survey. And it turned out I couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, we had an individual, people going as individuals to homes to conduct the survey. And we had to change it after the first day because we found not only were virtually everybody participating in the survey, or most of them if they were home, uh, but the, the, those conducting the surveys were being invited into homes, down into basements where people wanted to show them where the water line was. And then they would boot up their computer and show them pictures of flooding and so forth and what they realized. And right away, you could see immediately there was a lot of stress in the system because these people wanted to vent. And this was three years later. So uh, next slide, please. So one of the, uh, I can't see the next slide. So one of the questions uh, we presented at the door or documented was on a scale of zero to five, five being the worst, um, how much stress do you feel as a resident uh, that was either flooded or not flooded every time a major precipitation event occurs? So on a scale of zero to five, five being the worst, where do you, where do you reside? And what we found was that 48% of those people that realized a flooded basement ranked themselves as a 4.5 to five out of five every single time it rains for the amount of stress they feel uh, even three years after that event occurred as compared to almost nobody uh, feeling stress in the homes that hadn't uh, been flooded. So the amount of stress that these people are living with three years later is enormous. And by the way, we documented it all in this report uh, after the flood, the impact of climate change on mental health and lost time from work, which is on our website, anybody can see it. Um, and in conducting the survey that had a multitude of questions, this is just one I'm showing you the results for, uh, we also just documented what, what, what did people have to say about the stress they felt after going, going through this type of circumstance. And by the way, I think all of this can be extrapolated to fire risk and other perils. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so when we um, ask people, you know, what, are you, what are your thoughts, what are your perceptions, or what are your feelings pertaining to having gone through an event, uh, this flood event, or having a flooded basement, this is, this is that which they documented. No health issues, just my sanity. I have PTSD from it, the flooding. I think of something I want, and it's gone. My kids still question me when it rains, and you can read the, the additional one. Well, I'll just go to the bottom. I just hope nobody else has to go through it, that's for sure. In other words, the stress is great. So uh, what we want to do for sure is um, um, uh, put in place systems so that people don't have to experience this type of phenomena. And by the way, what you're looking at in the picture, uh, uh, some of you may remember Anna Maria Tremonti, who was the chair of The Current for a lot of years on CBC. I used to do a lot of shows with Anna Maria. Following the floods in, uh, in Burlington, uh, uh, we went out there and actually did uh, one of the shows for The Current to really document the stress that we, people felt in the community when they see this stuff up close. And this is Anna Maria talking with Rick Goldring, who's the, the uh, 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 mayor of Burlington. Uh, next slide, please. The um, one of the things we didn't do for our study, but other studies have done, they've also documented the uh, uh, elevations, if any, in medications to deal with psychosocial or mental health stress or anxiety that people may feel. And 
Uh, the um, yeah, I think somebody's asking if we can remove the box from the screen. There we go. Good. The um, and in other studies that have been done, for example, following the Calgary flood of 2013. Uh, one group found that there was a 164% increase in anti-anxiety uh, medications uh, being written in, in communities and 232% increase in antidepressants being uh, medications to deal with uh, depression. And in terms of uh, lost time for work, 12 in following flooding in Quebec, uh, and, and there haven't been a lot of studies done on this stuff, but 12% uh, had to take uh, sick leave or uh, they were absent from work following the flooding. And 6% uh, took early retirement, presumably attributable to, to the flooding. Uh, next slide, please. The, um, one of the other things we documented in the Burlington community was we wanted to know what amount of time, if any, do you miss from work in dealing with floods uh, the, uh, to remedy your house, to bring it back into working order. And we found that for in flooded households, the average amount of time that a person missed from work, day, this is days from work, not just the weekends, but actual days off of work, they missed 7.1 days of work from work uh, uh, if their house had experienced flooding to virtually nothing if, if they hadn't. And this is material because for the data I showed you early on about the escalating costs of uh, 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 catastrophic loss claims costs, those are all claims realized by property and casualty insurers to bring houses back into working order. But claims associated with um, uh, 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 medications to deal with psychosocial stress or counseling services or lost time from work, this is not covered under property and casualty insurance. This is under life and health insurance. So life and health insurers who quite frankly up to very recently did not really think climate change really had implications for them. Well, it actually does. And increasingly so we're finding out that they will see escalated claims for uh, 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 lost time from work, psychosocial stress and counseling services. So all of this keeps directing to, we don't wanna have flooding if we can avoid it. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally with Burlington, we also pulled people uh, and, and their, uh, the degree to which they experienced the, the difficulties outlined on the uh, uh, x-axis of this graph. Uh, we documented what percentage of them feel uh, problematic for, in the lower left hand corner, sleeping difficulties for um, 30 days after a flood, the major flood, versus post 30 days after a flood, but both in under conditions of a flooded community, and as compared to sleeping, sleeping difficulties uh, that people realize just normally if, if they had never experienced flooding. And what you can see is that there really was no significant difference from a, a physical uh, health impact, at least in this component of our study, in terms of sleeping difficulties, new breathing difficulties. Uh, we actually found that people who hadn't been flooded had more breathing difficulties than those that were flooded. And I don't know if that means when we cleaned up a house that um, we got rid of mold or something like that. I'm not sure to explain that one, but it is what it is. Uh, stomach cramps were not particularly problematic. Skin rashes were not problematic. The worsening of existing health issues did not prove problematic, but worrying and stress beyond the normal uh, shot right up. Uh, certainly the stress was enormously high uh, immediately following the, the flood, but it perpetuated in the post period, even 30 days beyond. So psychosocial stress due to these events is really problematic. Um, next slide, please. So all of that stuff is the bad news. The good news is there's a lot we can do and are doing, by the way, in the country to mitigate um, ex various forms of extreme weather risk, whether flood, fire, heat. I'm going to zero in on flooding right now because that, that's the most expensive peril to the country and the most ubiquitous in nature of applicability that people experience. So let me just talk about what we're doing to mitigate flood risk in the country. And in so doing, not realize the catastrophic loss claims costs and the costs realized through various aspects of uh, psychosocial or mental health stress. We wanna put these measures in place so we don't have all the problems we just talked about. I.e., remember at the beginning, I said the best way to solve a problem is to not have it. Well, here's how you not have it. You implement programs to, to negate the, pro the, the, the probability of the, the problem occurring. In the upper left-hand corner, uh, you'll see a document, it's called Home, uh, Home Below It. Uh, 
this is a document that, that has gives guidance as to actions that can be taken at the level of the individual home around the outside of the property and in the basement itself to make it such that when they're applied, the probability of that house realizing a flood at basement is much lower than if you don't put those measures in place. And, and I'll show you what they look like in a few minutes. And by the way, every document you see here had between about 60 to 80 people contribute to its writing. These were people, uh, uh, builders, developers, engineers, insurance people, uh, 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 conservation authorities, anybody who had elements of expertise that could contribute to flood risk mitigation as per the different areas designated was part of the solution, was part of the writing of these documents and guidelines that looked at practical and meaningful and cost-effective ways to mitigate flood risk. And they were, and by the way, these efforts are all supported very well by the Standards Council of Canada, the National Research Council, Canadian Standards Association, and certainly the INTAC Centre uh, right smack dab in the middle of pretty much all of them, and, uh, and then lots of other you know, smart, dedicated people. So we've got home flood risk mitigation in the upper left-hand corner. We've also developed new guidance for the country uh, going counterclockwise on how to build new residential communities going forward with fundamental features and characteristics in place that make it such that when the big storms hit, those communities aren't flooded out. And by the way, that starts with don't build on a floodplain. Uh, next, we have uh, flood risk mitigation for existing communities, for communities that are already up and running. Uh, this document outlines how we can identify at the community level where the areas are in a community that are the most vulnerable to flooding, and then actions that can be taken to mitigate flood risk or help to mitigate flood risk using berms, diversion channels, holding ponds, cistern, bioswales that can direct water to, to locations to keep people and infrastructure out of harm's way. For commercial real estate, we know actions to be taken to mitigate or lower the risks associated with, with, with basement flooding in uh, office towers and condominium towers and so forth. We're doing a lot of work in the area of retaining and restoring natural infrastructure to mitigate flood risk. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, an area that's in a very active state of development right now. Um, as I mentioned early on, uh, about 60 to 80% of natural infrastructure, forest fields and wetlands that were originally here in the country through the southern parts of provinces have been removed. We wanna bring them back to give water a place to go when the big storms hit. It also supports uh, carbon capture and sequestration, biodiversity, pollution prevention, and it retains aesthetics in communities. We're just completing now in the upper right-hand corner that will be released in about two months from now, a new coastline resiliency standard. Uh, what can we do on Canada's east and west coasts to mitigate the soci uh, problems associated with sea level rise, storm surge, and king tides hitting simultaneously? The findings from all these reports uh, have been uh, uh, put into one document, uh, almost uh, the equivalent of the executive summaries of these to make it very user-friendly for ministers and deputy ministers and premiers and mayors and councillors and everybody else you want to do this stuff. We've put the key findings of these reports and direction that's practical, meaningful, cost-effective to mitigate flood risk in one report. The only one that's missing here, by the way, that we'll develop in the next, uh, I would say two years, we need a shoreline resiliency standard for the Great Lakes. This is another area that's very problematic and stressful for people in the country, great stress, you know, uh, as their homes are disappearing into the lake. Um, uh, we'll develop that standard in the next couple of years. But let me just show you on the next slide when we developed the housing report, we actually, part of what went into developing that report on, on flood risk mitigation at the level of the house, we went into, meaning the intact center, about six or 700 homes for a period of two to three hours in, multitude, in a multitude of provinces across the country. And, uh, the, uh, and we documented around the outside of the property and then the basement itself, uh, the, the percentage of areas that were problematic that if left unattended could contribute to flooding. And what we found, for example, and uh, the numbers were on the right-hand side, I'm not sure why it says value percent, but anyhow, the, what we found, and I won't go through all this data, but the green bars designate problems around the outside of a person's property that could contribute to flooding. The blue bars are for things in the basement that if left unattended could contribute to flooding. And then uh, the yellow bars look at maintenance issues that could that if left unattended could contribute to flooding. 
But what we found was as simple as, for example, in the green bars, I'll just zero in on one or two. Uh, if you look at the, the, the second green bar down, uh, grading directs water towards foundations. We found that 69% of homes in the country, rounded off to 70%, have somewhere around the house that the grading around the property directs water towards the basement, towards the house versus away from it. It's, it's rather shocking. Um, on the blue bar, I want to mention uh, in, in the middle graph, the third blue bar down, it says valuables at risk of water damage. And that number was 65%. Uh, 65% in the basement had valuables at risk in the basement that if the basement flooded, they get waterlogged, covered probably with sewer water. This is the one from a psychosocial or mental health perspective that is easily the most problematic. And this is the one, a matter of fact, when you're even discussing with residents the loss of these valuables, this is where they start crying, literally. And it, 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 it's, it's lost wedding albums, it's lost pictures of, of kids in school, it's mementos of various types. This is the one, everything else usually can be replaced in the basement, but this is the one that, that when they turn to this uh, uh, factor that they, they really start to break down. And by the way, we're not guessing about this. We've been in hundreds and hundreds of homes doing these evaluations. Um, on the next slide, um, um, the, uh, what we're documenting here, and you're not meant to read all these details. You can look at all this stuff later, and it's all on our website. But we've developed, by way of solution, a very simple info infographic of 15 boxes that you see here, uh, of which along the top row are five things you can do around a house for no money that when implemented, lower the probability that you'll end up with a flooded basement. And then in the middle row are actions you can take for less than $250 to lower basement flood risk. And on the bottom row are things that are a little bit more than $250, but also contribute to mitigating flood risk. And these are actions that can be uh, deployed by the vast, vast majority of homeowners on their own without special expertise for no great amount of money, generally speaking over a long weekend. And it's as simple as, for example, just with one or two illustrations, if you look at the top row, there's a, a box there with a red circle around it. Test your sub pump. In a basement, uh, below the, the floor level, very often in basements, you'll see a, a, what looks like a bucket in the ground and, and a pump in it, and that's called a sub pump. And if water flows into the basement, it goes into that bucket below grade level and pumps water outside. What we find is that the... Um, what you want to do is test that sub pump to make sure it works such that a big storm hits, you're, you're, you'll, you'll be in a safe zone. Um, and to test it is simply a matter of taking a bucket of water, pouring it in the sump well, and seeing does the pump turn on and pump water outside. And if it does, you're in good shape. But if it doesn't, you want to attend to it. You would not believe the vast majority of people that realize that have a flooded basement, the first time they realize their sub pump doesn't work or was seized up is when they have four feet of sewer water in their basement. So this is something they should check uh, twice a year. Um, and by the way, I see a question there about where can they look for this. This is all on our website, very easily accessible. On the middle row, um, the, um, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, for example, putting a plastic cover over a window well. So for windows at grade level, you just put a plastic cover over them, and it makes it such that when the big storms hit, the water can't fill the window well and flow into the basement. And these things are about $35, $40, $40 a piece. In the lower right uh, corner, you'll see uh, uh, the sub pump, but in this case with, with a, a battery attached to it. The time you need the sub pump to work is when the big storms hit, obviously. And, uh, um, but very often when the big storms hit, the electricity goes out. So the time you might need the sub pump to work is when the big storms are hitting and when the electricity goes out, well, then it doesn't do you any good. So you want battery backup supply that is a couple of hundred dollars for a kit that can be put in by almost anybody. And, uh, and put you in a safer zone that it will run for a couple of days in the absence of electricity. And by the way, this infographic right now is being sent out to tens of hundreds of thousands of homes, I guess it is now, uh, in communities across the country with people's property, with, with their tax notices. Communities are closing this with their tax notices to give people an uh, idea of what to do um, um, to protect their homes from basement flooding. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just, uh, yep. Uh, 
Yep, that one. So the, um, and also I just, you know, we had a little bit of good news that was announced in uh, British Columbia last week by the Prime Minister and John Wilkinson, the Federal Minister of Environment and Climate Change, that based on the materials, quite frankly, that I just showed you that uh, we've been working with the government for quite a number of years now, uh, the federal government has embraced direction on home flood protection, uh, where, whereby they released last week or made an announcement of the following. They said, Canada will create a climate adaptation home rating program as a companion to uh, the Energide home energy audits. Uh, and I won't go into further details here. It's material written on the page. It's all easily accessible anywhere. If you, if you type the, the title on the right, fighting wildfires and adapting to a changing climate, that's what the prime minister announced and read about. Um, the good thing about this national initiative is that we've got flooding as the number one cost in Canada affecting, well, it's the number one physical cost and psychosocial stressor due to climate change are right at the top of the list. Now we've got the federal government that in addition to deploying the Energide program to look at, go into homes and assess the degree to which they're energy efficient and deficiencies that may exist that can be corrected to make homes more energy efficient. In one-stop shopping, that person will now also evaluate homes in reference to flood risk potential and remedies that can be put in place to mitigate basement flood risk all in one-stop shopping. So, uh, this may sound minor, but remember, this is the most expensive cost in Canada due to climate change. This is a, a major step forward. Next slide, please. And then we're almost done. Um, we're exactly what we've done for home flood protection. And by the way, we have similar direction at the community level uh, for uh, um, uh, new community design, existing communities. Um, we also have direction in having worked with an organization called Fire Smart Canada. We can also take homes, businesses, and communities in forested regions. And there's a tremendous amount of, of actions you can take proactively relative to homes and communities that make it such that when these fires hit that are proving so problematic at the moment, that we can very much lower the probability that homes will be impacted by these fires. Um, those initiatives are outlined on this chart, again, available on our website. But if we go to the next slide, um, you can see some of the pictures on the right. Many of the actions that can be deployed to, to lower the probability of fire being problematic and causing homes to burn down are fairly straightforward. And they include, for example, initiatives such as uh, removing shrubbery or any burnable materials within, uh, immediate, within a meter and a half of the house. We want homes with fireproof or fire protective cladding, fire protective roofs, fire protected back porches. Uh, we, wanna, we don't want people storing their wood right up alongside the back door of the house, as, along the, the back of the house itself, such that it, when it ignites, it burns down the house. Um, we, and we, want, uh, we, wanna, we don't want to plant shrubbery as well, I guess as I mentioned, but not right up against the wall of the house that when it ignites and burns, the heat transfers into the house and cause the house to burn down. And then we want an exclusion house uh, zone around uh, homes to particularly with con coniferous trees to, to get them back and away from the house such that they ignite, hopefully they don't burn the house down. So this is an area that we're also working on to deploy these measures to um, lower uh, fire risk. And, uh, and by the way, for everything I talked about for flooding or fires, I'm not saying that these are categorical solutions that if you put these in place, you can't have a flood or you can't have a fire, but it very, very much lowers the probability of, of occurrence. Uh, next slide, please. We're also developing right now uh, a new uh, heat standard or guideline for Canada. Uh, Canada is gonna get a lot hotter going forward for sure. Uh, uh, we have an, we are going to realize an increase in the number of extreme heat days in the country. And depending on whose definition you look at, these are days uh, that exceed 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, I, I don't know the numbers for other, every part of Canada, but for example, I live in the Toronto area. Uh, right now in, in the Toronto area, we realize about 20 to two, 22 days per summer that exceed uh, 30 degrees Celsius. And that's going by all projections are that it's going to go to 60 to 65 days in excess of 30 degrees Celsius by 2040-45. Our maximum temperature realized in this region right now is about, uh, uh, by the way, sorry, I'm on still the Toronto and Southern Ontario area because I just happen to know these numbers. Uh, maximum uh, uh, temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. 
that is going to go to 42 to 44 degrees Celsius. And right now in Southern Ontario, uh, we have uh, 0.6 heat waves per summer. That's three days in a row where the temperature doesn't drop below 30 degrees Celsius day or night. And that's projected to go to two to 2.5 heat waves per summer. So we're developing guidance on heat risk mitigation that'll focus at uh, the community level to reduce the heat island effect by, and I just put a couple of quick points here, but white roofs versus dark roofs that reflect sunlight, more tree canopy within uh, communities and cities, uh, relative to infrastructure and partic particularly uh, um, uh, large apartment buildings and condo towers, but apartment buildings in particular, we want to make sure we have backup generation uh, for electricity. Um, if we have a major heat wave combined with an electricity outage, such that fans, air conditioners, and even elevators don't function for extended period of times in these buildings during a, during a heat wave, that's a deadly combination. Uh, about uh, I don't know all the numbers up to date for uh, BC right now, but for example, two and a half years ago or three years ago in Quebec, we had about 90 people die during a heat wave. Had that heat wave uh, coincided with a major electricity outage, those, those deaths would have been in the hundreds, if not thousands. Um, and then also at the individual level, we need preparedness. For example, who's looking in on and who is identified a priori? Who are the vulnerable people in the population that may be living alone in the back of a rooming house somewhere? Who's checking on that person who might be elderly or have respiratory problems that during a heat wave, they're okay. So that's uh, all being factored into this um, um, guideline that, that others are leading on. Uh, the la next slide and last slide, actually. Please. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, no, that's the end of it. Uh, is there any way to get to the, yeah, here we go. The, uh, so just in conclusion, and then a few ideas about next steps, uh, the just in terms of the cost, the cost of climate change and extreme weather events should be considered, in my opinion at least, in equal measure relative to the impact on physical infrastructure, which is almost where all the attention is focused to date, but it should also include impacts on mental health, physical well-being, and lost time from work. We need to do a lot more work in this area and have a much stronger sense of appreciation for the mental, psychosocial health impacts, lost time from work in equal measure to the cost of physical infrastructure loss. Uh, in terms of pre uh, preparation and protection, we need to get out of the scenario of, of, of we, are, we need to avoid management by disaster scenarios. Very often you get people, everybody's attention comes to a problem when it's actually occurring or has occurred in the immediate aftermath. We want to get ahead of the curve on this file. And I think health associations and practitioners, a lot of people on this call, quite frankly, we should work more closely together and people on the health end of the equation, which those have been working on aspects of the physical and negative impacts of flood, fire, and extreme heat to further promote and more aggressively deploy adaptation measures to, to mitigate risk. And the bottom line is this, in my opinion, on the climate file for Canada, the thing that's missing more than anything is a sense of urgency. We do not have the luxury of time on climate change in reference to acting to mitigate risks that are coming at us full bore. Every day we don't adapt is a day we don't have. So thank you very much for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Feltmate, um, for a tremendous presentation. Um, since uh, we're a little short on time, we'll um, quickly, there are some questions already posted. Um, so we'll uh, start asking some of them. Um, one of the questions is, um, do you have information for multi-unit residential buildings? And I think this person clarified at the end, uh, is the info only for single family homes or does it also apply to apartments and multi-unit buildings? Yes, if, if, I don't know if you can recall, but on that one slide I showed with, with all the different reports, one of them there is on commercial real estate and a great deal of what's in that report in terms of mitigating flood risk would apply to MERVs. Okay. And it's on our website. So uh, the third one over. Or, Sorry. Yeah, uh, that one ahead of the storm. Uh, yes, there's a lot of direction in there for multi-unit residential buildings. Okay, great. Um, and 
Another question is, uh, did you collect sociodemographic data during these assessments? I'm curious, given that racialized low-income communities often are hit first and worst by climate impacts. No, and I wish we, and, and, and the answer is no. And should we? The answer is yes. Uh, so we're, in my view, we're still in the embryonic stages of this, this research. And that, that certainly is an area to focus on going forward that should be high priority. <coughs> and by the way, even for example, you look at Burlington, the stress people feel, quite frankly, I don't know if everybody knows Burlington, but it's, it's a wealthy community. And so if they're feeling stress due to flooded basements in this case, you can just imagine for people with fewer resources, it's gonna be even worse. Right. Um, yeah, and uh, I think the next question is, you kind of answered that already, What are or partially, what are solutions for residents who don't have $100 and or a long weekend to spare? And I'm concerned that many will also not have access to insurance, et cetera. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one, but quite frankly, there are a lot of things you can do around your house for nothing, for no dollars in terms of preparedness, like for example, changing the grading around your house or double checking that your sub pump works. Or, you know, There's a number of actions that you can engage proactively to avoid the problems associated with basement flooding. And by the way, down to and including, believe it or not, and, and, and we have good confidence in these numbers. We went into about six or 700 homes. You know, 33%, 35% of the homes we went into, the little drain in the basement that is there for if your dishwasher overflowed or your washing machine overflowed for water to flow away, 35% of homes in the country have that covered up. It's either tiled over or otherwise blocked so, so forget climate change, if their dishwasher overflowed or a pipe broke in the house, they'd have a flooded basement. So these are all things that you can do that anybody can do for free for no expertise to, to, to limit your risk. Great, um, and the next question is, can you please comment on the feasibility of creating Canadian urban sponge cities as part of green infrastructure intervention against flood-related stormwater management, particularly in circumventing devastation from flash floods? Yeah, well, we're, we're going at the file aggressively right now uh, for reasons I'm not quite sure, but I guess just the, the preeminence and growth and flood risk in the country Natural infrastructure, retaining and restoring natural infrastructure to mitigate flood risk is drawing a, a, a lot more a, a attention in, the, I would say, the last two or three years. But we really now need to focus on, when we talk about retaining and restoring natural infrastructure to mitigate flood risk, what specifically are we recommending? First of all, what do we mean by that? And then specifically, what are we recommending? And that's what's missing from the equation now. We sort of have an anecdotal uh, uh, direction on, on the file, but we need uh, more specifics. So one of the groups we'll work with going forward to deploy natural, uh, natural infrastructure is the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. But we're not far enough along the equation yet to really say, but what specifically is the ask? And uh, so it's a great question and, uh, and we're working on the solution. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Um, there, there was an earlier question about um, whether or not, it's a little big though, is there data for BC? I guess some of the earlier data that you presented on. Yes. National, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it's quite frankly, it's available to anybody pretty much. The, the, if, if, if you send a note to the Insurance Bureau of Canada and say to them, Can we, could I see the catastrophic loss claims data for British Columbia? Uh, they'll send it to you. Okay. But virtually every province you look at, the trend is, is an upward bend in the curve in terms of cost for every single province. It's just a matter of how, how high the, the bend goes up depending on the province. Great. Um, and uh, what do you, there's a, um, what do you think of the, Actually, oh, okay, here's the question. What do you think of the Climate Risk Institute's infrastructure resilience program? Is that a question? Yeah, I think so. Uh, the, so the, the, the uh, Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, 
if, if that's the organization they're talking about, I'm not quite sure because there's a number of them. But um, for that particular one, I, 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 I think they're doing a very good job. And uh, I pretty much have my fingers in the pies of a lot of these organizations in the country. And the, the challenge is this. Many of these organizations have pretty good ideas on what needs to be done to mitigate risk, and it will make good sense, it'll be logical, et cetera, well supported by research. What, but what they need to do, in my opinion, more aggressively is that it's not just knowing the answer, it's working then very, very aggressively with, with everybody at the federal, provincial, or municipal levels to actually de to de deploy these practices. You've got to be very, very tenacious to take these ideas and turn them into practical reality. That announcement that the Prime Minister made with John Wilkinson last week on home flood protection and further work in, in this area with uh, CMHC, it's taken us five to seven years to get that launched and in place. So it, it, you, you've got to be like a dog on a bone when you're, when you're on these files. Great, thank you. Um... Thank you very much. And uh, if um, is there are there any other questions out there? And if um, anybody thinks of any, I'm happy to take them later on if they email me. Um, Dr. Filtmate, you mentioned that um, one of the sort of low cost measures to take would be to um, work on grading around your household, uh, um, around a house. Um, wouldn't that usually sort of take um, somebody more licensed to do? Or is that like, don't you need a plan for grading? And um, yeah, just wondering how how would go how to go about that at a, at a low cost, um, in a low cost way. Yeah, and 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 by the way, it can ever it can be everything from you know no cost to to higher cost depending on the, your situation. But the um, but the best thing to do, and this sounds crazy, but nonetheless, uh, when a big big storm hits around your property, take an umbrella and walk around the property and see where if if water is pooling up somewhere and to what degree, and if it's not overly uh, uh, dramatic where the problematic areas might be you could you may be able to solve that yourself or with the help of relatives or whatever it is you know get people in who can do it without having a health issue themselves uh, but if it's if it looks more dramatic than that which you can solve yourself uh, quite frankly it's almost non-negotiable somewhere or another you 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 have to make the expenditure to remedy the problem because I can tell you for sure if you have the flood, cost associated with the flood will be an order of magnitude greater, if not more, than the cost to remedy it. Um, and, and as a general rule of thumb, by the way, and this shows up in studies all over the world, I don't know why it works out to this ratio, but it always does. For $1 invested in adaptation, generally speaking, we realize about a three to $8 savings per 10 year period for damage that now doesn't occur if you put the adaptation measures in place. So think of it as, if you drove down your street and you're coming up to your house and you looked up and you, and you saw a bunch of shingles missing off the roof, you don't say to yourself, well, it's sunny out today. And by the way, it's going to be sunny for the rest of the week. Therefore, I don't think I have a problem. You know, No, you have a problem. You have to fix it and it's non-negotiable, except when it's the basement and it's flood risk, people tend to ignore it more than if it's obvious as per you know, the, the, the shingles on the roof. Thank you. Um, I know we're running out of time, but if um, I think one person would like to ask one more question, um, David Nicholson, could you please unmute yourself? I think you do have a question if you don't mind um, answering a quick one. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, could you tell me what standards should current uh, residential property developers use when they're designing stormwater management systems. I noticed one uh, developer here locally in Southern Ontario using uh, a specifications in 2006. Doesn't seem right to me. Yeah, no, I, well, I, I mean, I don't know the numbers of all the standards, but they are a lot of them. I don't know of all of them, but a lot of them in that, uh, well, the report I can see on the screen right now under new community design, there are a lot of standards referenced in that report and the one uh, under one umbrella 
that can be uh, that can serve as guidelines for uh, builders or developers in reference to building flood risk flood risk mitigation into new communities. And and by the way, the other thing is if you contact the Canadian Standards Association, I think you'd find them very forthcoming in reference to the most up to date standards that they. Of pertaining to community flood risk uh, mitigation. I, I know, yeah, I know them very well. Okay. Well, um, thank you. Um, I think that is all the time we have for questions. If anybody has any further questions, um, please email them. Um, or if you've written them down and they've been missed, we will send that to Dr. Feltmate um, and send the answers to you later. Thank you everyone for joining us and um, have a great afternoon or evening. Thank you very much.